of figures. The huge bronze statue of Hercules is one of the few extant works of this type. Struck by lightning, buried in ground by superstitious Romans and found in 1864, it was sold to Pope Pius IX. The statues in Sala Rotonda recall the pagan world persecuting Christians who refused to worship gods and people considered gods but were ready to die for God who became man. A heavy door resembling the gates of a pagan temple lead to a room designed on the shape of the Greek cross and named accordingly. This design, unprecedented in pagan temples, was employed by the early Christians in the churches they erected. Two porphyry sarcophagi of two women, empress and saints, Saint Constance, daughter of Constantine, who was converted to Christianity in the fourth century, and Saint Helen, mother of Emperor Constantine, who found Christ's cross in Jerusalem. The sarcophagus of the empress was discovered in 1154. At first it was placed in the Basilica of Saint John Lateran, and then moved to the Vatican Museums. Today, the two take us from the collection of pagan art to the Sistine Chapel, where the past and the present meet. In the Vatican museums, we may also find the oldest works of Christian art. Carved sarcophagi from the 4th century AD show the early attempts at the artistic expression of the theological communication of the new faith. Some of them, quite primitive in form, attest to the wealth of their founders. The spouses who ordered the work in 340 were undoubtedly well off and could engage the best craftsmen to make the carved Bible. On the walls of the sarcophagus called the dogmatic sarcophagus, we may see the first image of the Holy Trinity. The art served to illustrate the complex notion of three persons in one. In the early decades of Christianity, which was the time of theological disputes and debates, art found its place in the church as a tool of evangelization. The magnificent relief takes us 1,700 years back. Naturalistic and charming details form a framework for the uncommon story running in the center of the work. Jonah is thrown out of the boat and swallowed by a sea monster. Three days later, the monster spits him out. Exhausted with the dramatic events, the prophet is resting in the shade of the grapevine. The sculptor shaped Jonah's body, Old Testament gospel of Christ's death and resurrection, as a Greek hero's body. While the church was fighting heresies, artists endeavored to make Christianity more comprehensible through art, Popper's Bible. As Christianity was gaining strength, the Roman Empire was collapsing. The 5th century saw the beginning of invasions of Rome first by Alaric, then the Empire Falls. Another invasion by Totila, king of the Ostrogoths, destroys Rome almost completely. In those difficult years, the papacy tends the city, bringing it gradually back to life. Art blossoms again, Rome returns to the world arena.
Non sembra possibile. It seems impossible that violence could break into this peaceful garden. However, a thousand years ago, the place was exposed to a number of devastating attacks. In 850, to protect St. Peter's tomb, Pope Leo IV built walls, surrounding the area which would later become Vatican City State. As popes reasserted their authority in Rome, threats to the papacy grew. In 1307, when the walls did not guarantee safety anymore, the papal court moved to Avignon, France. The orphaned Rome turned to art again. The most eminent painter of that epoch alive, Giotto, was called upon to paint the Cardinal Stefaneschi Polyptic, an extraordinary altarpiece as an ornament for the Apostles' tomb. When Romans started to build their first churches, they decorated their apses with mosaics to emphasize the significance of the altar. As the mosaic art faded away, a new method of accenting the sacred space of the altar was developed an altarpiece. In the Pinacoteca of the Vatican Museums, we shall find many altarpieces. None of them as splendid as the Stefaneschi Polyptic by Giotto. The altarpiece was placed over the Apostle's tomb. Its genuine gilt frames decorated with Gothic spires may be seen in the hands of its founder, Cardinal Stefaneschi. Saint Peter, huge, wrapped in a red robe, seems to be truly present despite the absence of his successor in the Vatican. The size and opulence of the work were intended to lead pilgrims like a lighthouse along the Isle of the Basilica. Giotto's use of the perspective is surprising. The square floor transfers our space to the space of God, in which a large and majestic Christ is enthroned. He is surrounded by a crowd of angels whose halos hide some faces. The Savior's throne is three-dimensional and side apertures make it possible to look at his face. Naturalism is another dimension of the work. When the Mother of God is holding baby Jesus with respect due to the imperial heir, he imitates an ordinary child putting his fingers in his mouth. The presence of Mary is tangible. Her knees seem to stick out and the weight of her body pushes the cushion's edges upward. Giotto introduces a new participant to art, a figure standing with his back to us. The artist knows we are looking. Involving the viewer's emotions, Giotto imposes a new duty on them, makes them a witness to the story which is taking place before their eyes. When popes were in Avignon, Rome was declining. When they finally returned to Rome, they found it devastated after a hundred years of struggles between local aristocratic families. Undiscouraged, they set down to its reconstruction, which initiated the Renaissance. Pope Nicholas V turned this defense tower to a site of prayers and assigned the fourth floor for his private chapel. Nicholas V called Fra Angelico, monk and artist, to Rome to paint frescoes depicting the lives of St. Stephen and St. Lawrence. Fra Angelico was later declared patron of artists. His work had the same joyful spirit which shaped his faith. The lives of martyrs are not depicted with photographic precision. Obviously, Fra Angelico knew the latest trends in painting. During St. Stephen's sermon, the robes of women seated around him dropped down realistically. And the figures had both weight and three dimensions. The artist is an ingenious master of linear perspective. He creates harmonious spaces and uses ancient architecture as framework for the scenes he paints. However, the art by Beato Angelico does not boil down to perspective and naturalism only. Fra Angelico paints and brings out the inner peace of saints. Roman soldiers are banging on the door, but Pope Sixtus II is calmly entrusting Lawrence with treasures. Solely the cardinal turning his head toward the door suggests that danger is imminent. Soft colors and harmonious deployment of figures clearly contrast with the brutality of torturers. St. Lawrence was flogged with whips studded with nails and bit by scorpions. And yet Fra Angelico paints his placid acceptance of martyrdom. Burned alive, the saint remains calm.
Saint Stephen, stoned to death, is praying peacefully, apparently insensitive to pain. Both martyrs, optimistic and trusting in their faith, emanate spirituality. The Renaissance Florence was already called a new Athens, while Rome was lagging far behind. It was not before Sixtus IV was elected Pope that Rome had regained the title of Caput Mundi. The new Pope built roads, collected antique works of art, and restored order to the Eternal City. Embellishing Rome, Sixtus IV founded many works of art. A number of them was by a pictor Pavlis, Melozzo da Forli. His angels playing music, kept at the Pinacoteca Vaticana, bear witness to the elegance of his painting through their shining colors and gentle gestures of the persons. Pope Sixtus was immortalized by this fresco by Melozzo da Forli. This is the first official portrait of the papal family. The Pope, a renowned scholar, tripled the number of volumes in the Vatican Library and appointed Bartolomeo Platina its first prefect. The fresco relates this moment. Sixtus IV is enthroned with his sharp profile to the viewer. Next to him there is Cardinal Pietro Riario, his nephew, while Cardinal Giuliano, the future Julius II, is standing in front of his uncle. Bartolomeo Platina, dressed in a robe which seems to flow into the viewer's space, is kneeling next to them. The Pope's two nephews are brandishing golden chains, a token of their high social position. Melozzo uses a bottom-up perspective, making his figures dignified and grand. The fresco's frames are covered with the coat of arms of the Della Rovere, acorns and oak leaves, attesting to the great aspirations of this papal dynasty. Not only did Sixtus IV strive to improve the quality of life inside the Vatican walls, but also contributed to the living standards of the inhabitants of Rome, a city about which a contemporary chronicler wrote that it is neglected and desolate. He commissioned Ponte Sisto, the first bridge spanning the river Tiber since ancient times. As beautiful as useful, the bridge made it easier for numerous pilgrims to reach the Vatican. Sixtus IV tended to the spiritual development of the population of Rome as well. He funded the reconstruction of the Church of San Pietro al Mantorio, which was considered the site of St. Peter's death at those times. With a view to the spiritual demands of pilgrims arriving through the North Gate to Rome, he commissioned a new church of Santa Maria del Popolo, 